We did a survey of uh, Malachi over a year ago, but I think it, it's a book that warrants us going into a little more depth, so we're going to jump in to the, uh, the book of Malachi, the Italian book of the Old Testament. And of course, I'm kidding. Malachi is generally regarded by most uh, people familiar with the Bible as the end of the Old Testament. That's actually not quite right. We're going to discover some things that the Old Testament didn't really end with Malachi, but I'll leave that for another session. But uh, Malachi is a very short little book, but very rich in the issues that it deals with. The name itself, Malachi, translates into my messenger. And there are many uh, scholastic conjectures uh, that uh, this might have been a title or an assumed name by the writer. And, and I won't weary you with all the scholastic arguments, including, by the way, the Septuagint and also the Targum of Jonathan, Jerome, and Rabbi Rashi. These are very venerated rabbinical sources, uh, have various views on this. But uh, I side with the most modern scholars that believe it was his proper name. Many Hebrew names, of course, are translatable and have a meaning, but Malachi, I believe, really was his proper name. It's not a big issue, but I mention that. You should be aware, though, there are some experts that think it was really a title. In fact, um, the Targum of Jonathan, Jerome, and Rabbi Rashi understood Malachi to be a title for Ezra the scribe. There are other church fathers that uh, linked Malachi with the town of Sophia or Sapphira in Zebulun, and there's all kinds of traditions. Uh, some of the ancient traditions uh, believe he was of the tribe of Zebulun and that he died while young, but those are all just traditions. Uh, there certainly is, is not a thing in the text that justify the, those things. But we do know the background of the book takes place after the return from Babylon. One of the great milestones in the history of Israel, of course, was the Babylonian captivity. In fact, to, to back up a little bit, uh, which will be meaningful, you know, after the death of Solomon, there was a civil war, and the nation Israel split into two parts. The northern a group uh, of ten tribal areas called uh, the, ho the House of Israel, and the southern division of the kingdom called the House of Judah. So those tribal names also are used for the two parts of the divided nation. The northern kingdom uh, went from bad to worse rather quickly, relatively quickly, and uh, God ultimately uses the Assyrian Empire as his instrument of judgment, and they're taken into captivity in 722. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, the southern kingdom, called the House of Judah, also went downhill. It had a couple revivals. It didn't go quite as rapidly as the northern kingdom. But it too, about a century after the northern kingdom goes into captivity, the southern kingdom is taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. By that time, Babylon had risen as the main empire and is used as God's judgment of the southern house of Israel. It's distinctive in the sense that it was predicted by Jeremiah that it would be in captivity only 70 years, and it would return. And uh, that Babylonian captivity is also called by the scholars the exile. It's when the nation was in exile. The northern kingdom was obliterated from history, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the southern kingdom returns. It's, it's considered an exile for those 70 years. It returns under the leadership of Ezra. When uh, the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians, Cyrus releases the prisoners to go home and rebuild their temple. And under Ezra, they attempt to do that. But with a lot of frustrations and not much progress, Cyrus even gave them financial incentives to go home. But only about 50,000 did. Many of the others decided they were comfortable where they were, and they stayed in Persia. And that led to a couple of centuries of history, which included Esther and all those events. But in any case, under Ezra, the rebuilding of the temple goes very slowly and frustratingly slowly because they could not protect themselves. They didn't have the authority to make Jerusalem a city-state. It's Nehemiah, who is the cupbearer to the king, one of the Persian kings. He solicits and gets authority some 19 years after the original uh, return to Babylon. He gets the authority to have the city walls rebuilt. That's a very key event in history if you understand Daniel's 70 weeks. And if you don't, I strongly encourage you to really do your homework on the most amazing prophecies in the Bible in the last four verses of Daniel 9. But we'll keep moving here. Most scholars date the book of Malachi as being somewhere in that period with uh, Nehemiah, under Nehemiah's leadership. They're still under the uh, thumb of Persia, in effect, but they were allowed to rebuild the city. Uh, 
So at the time Malachi is writing, the temple has been rebuilt. The priestly worship in the temple has, uh, has uh, uh, begun. But the people have fallen into some empty rituals and a spiritual decline. And their attitudes really laid the foundation for what later become the two extreme sects, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Sadducees being equivalent to what we would call liberals or modernists or what have you, and the Pharisees being the extreme legalists of their day. But it's interesting that the people that Malachi is going to be dealing with are insensitive to the love of God displayed toward them. And one of the main thoughts in the book of Malachi is the love of God, which is one of the reasons it calls our attention, and we want to look at that carefully. They were unaware of their own departure from the truth, from the will and the way of the Lord. And so they lacked reverence for him. So they had formalism. They're all busy with their ceremonies, busy with being uh, what they thought, uh, uh, following what they're supposed to do, but it was just empty rituals. Uh, It isn't hard for us to depart from that description of Israel in those days with America today, or maybe even more precisely, the church today in many respects. So Malachi ministered about the 5th century B.C. This is about 100 years after Cyrus uh, read the letter that Isaiah had uh, written to him by name 150 years earlier. So he issued the decree about 538 B.C. to permit the Jews to return back to their home. Now, the destruction of Edom the blood brother of Jacob that became his enemy that was to the east. The destruction of Edom was affected by the Nabataean Arabs who drove the Edomites out about 550 to 400 B.C. So it's in that same period that's also going to figure prominently, especially in the first chapter's comments here, because the Nabataean Arabs uh, wiped out the Edomites and set up the Idumean state in its place. And that destruction of Edom figures heavily in God's, uh, uh, in the words here, in God's uh, uh, contrast of his dealing with Edom and Israel. Now, in response to the ministries of Haggai and Zechariah, the repatriated Jews uh, rebuilt their temple, completing it about 515 B.C. Probably the wall at the stage was, had been uh, rebuilt or was being completed by Nehemiah's gang. I think the timing, as uh, different scholars differ subtly, but that's pretty, it's pretty established. Now, the enigma, you have to understand in candor with the population. In the minds of the returning Jews, this era was expected to be very different. See, from Ezekiel 34, they came to believe that their land was to rebound with miraculous fruitfulness. They read all these passages from Ezekiel 34, and it was supposed to be really uh, fruitful. The population was going to grow and swell to be a globally recognized group. The nation was to raise to a glorious new reign under a new David from Jeremiah 23. And all nations were going to come serve them, according to Isaiah 49. See, they looked at these promises. Now, if you examine those promises, they're really millennial, if you will. They're yet future. But obviously, they're returning to the land. They had all these expectations. And the realities of their life there was just the opposite. The land was languishing under drought. The population was a fraction of what it was before they went in captivity. There was like 50,000 in the nation at the time. And uh, they still were under the political dominion of Persia. So their, the life as they were experiencing it seemed to be such variance from what they had expected from the Scripture. So this is in the reign of Artaxerxes I, and uh, this is about the time that Persia was just beginning to get their stinging defeats from the Greeks. But Judah was still a vassal state and so forth. So this is also not distant, probably more than 100 years one way or the other from the time of Esther, etc., maybe much closer. And the harvests were poor due to locust damage and what have you. So most of the hearts of the people were indifferent or, if anything, resentful towards God. And that's what Malachi is going to deal with. The priests were violating the stipulations of the Mosaic law regarding their sacrifices, tithes, offerings. The people's uh, hope in God's covenant promises had dimmed. So they intermarried with pagans. They casually divorced their Israelite wives. And uh, they had great moral ambivalence. They oppressed the poor and they did uh, all kinds of things. Now, uh, some of this may sound very familiar. Maybe our conditions in this country are not as destitute as they were there starting with ba- in a barren land. And yet at the same time, uh, we can recognize ourselves as we examine the casualness of our lives, the total abrogation of moral rectitude in our culture, the fact that much of, if we do anything at all, how much of it is really empty formalism rather than having a real spiritual content. So there's some parallels to America today and uh, uh, much of the church today. And so at this time, to these people at least, the biblical promises seemed very remote, and that resulted in neglect and disobedience. 
It's interesting if you study carefully the things that stirred up Nehemiah, if you study the history of the period in the book of Nehemiah. There are about four or five major things that bothered Nehemiah, and these are the same four or five things that will be addressed in the book of Malachi. The defilement of the priesthood and uh, the disregard of the Sabbath, foreign marriages and the divorce of Israelite wives, the neglect of the tithes and the offerings and the oppression of the poor are all of the parallel passages from Malachi and Nehemiah. Now, Malachi is going to present a triple rebuttal to all of this. His first thing is going to point out that their suffering is linked to their sins from the top down. And as we watch that, uh, we should be alarmed and concerned because the sins in this country are broad and heavy, and they are also from the top down. And um, the other thing that Malachi is going to hit hard is that God's love was in evidence if they would just get off their pity party and compare their lot with the Edomites next door. And, uh, of course, the final response that Malachi has, he also points out that the day of the Lord was coming. And uh, the purpose that God has that runs throughout all history of course, will be climaxed in the day of the Lord, which is coming upon us. And so even though it's focusing, of course, on the problems of that day, we'll quickly discover that the Holy Spirit has something for all of us in this book. Now, Malachi's style is quite different than most of the other prophets. From the lofty language of Isaiah is one thing. All the prophets had some distinctive styles. Uh, Malachi is going to use a dialectical or a disputational style. It almost sounds, he, he writes as if it's an argument going on between himself and the people. He poses the questions that they presumably are asking rhetorically and then answers them. It's a, it's a very a disputational style. And this, of course, is an appropriate way to address the apathetic Israelites, but it's also a style that became very popular later in Judaism. In fact, um, uh, you can uh, even sense it in, um, in the Jewish culture today, this attraction to a disputational type of argumentation. And one of the things that uh, Malachi is going to deal with, there are several things he deals with uniquely, but he, he is going to close his book with a setup, if you will, of the New Testament. And uh, in terms of he will talk about a messenger identified uh, in chapter 4 as Elijah that would prepare the way of the Lord on the day of judgment. That's often misunderstood. The coming of Elijah there is uh, twofold. It's in type or in spirit, the coming of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is actually the one that closes the Old Testament. That startles many people. We think of the Old Testament as as a collection of books closing with Malachi. But uh, we'll discover some surprising things as we get into that that area. But it's Elijah's coming that uh, is focused on by uh, Malachi, and we're going to see relevance of that in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 11. But uh, there are two, you know, in any book that's sort of something that, one or two things that really leap out at you. God is going to make, in the chapter we're going to get into here, the statement that I have loved you. And we're going to talk a little bit about the love of God, which is one of the reasons I wanted to get into this book. And uh, the other statement he's going to make before the book closes is that I change not. The unchangeableness of God. I'm always attracted to that for lots of reasons. Because first of all, one of the great discoveries as you study the Bible is to discover that the 66 books, the 39 of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New, are an integrated message. Every number, every detail is there by design. It's an integrated package. And the God of the Old Testament is identical to the God in the New. There's no difference. There are some myths that we get in Sunday school. Uh, we speak, we visualize the God of the Old Testament with a certain se- series of characteristics and the God of the New in contrast to that. That's fiction. That's a shame. That's an unfortunate misunderstanding. God changes not. That's an exciting thing. He's a God you can rely upon. The Allah of the Quran is capricious, fanciful, unpredictable. It emphasizes that. The Islamic following emphasizes that. Their whole style uh, recognizes a changeable, capricious, uh, unpredictable God. The Allah of the Quran has got no comparison to the God of the Old Testament who makes and keeps his promises that God does not change. And nothing, nowhere is that more important than understanding his love because his love also never changes. Well, so much for some introductory comments. Uh, Let's jump into chapter 1 of the book of Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament as as it's presented in the English Bible. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord of Israel by Malachi. The word burden, or masa, is a message of rebuke rather than comfort or encouragement. Now, it can be comfort and encouragement, but the, the term burden, it's an ominous term. 
It suggests in its weight impending judgment. We find that word frequently used among the prophets. The very opening gives you a sense of impending judgment. But you notice it says, It's the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I want to pause here to uh, refocus on some things that we've talked about in the past, but I want to use the occasion to nail down right now. You notice how it's referring to Israel. This book is written after the Babylonian captivity. There are those that say it should say Judah. No, it says Israel. That's exactly what it says. The point I'm trying to emphasize is there is no lost ten tribes of Israel. There are a number of groups on the landscape that build elaborate, very colorful, elaborate um, discussions that are built on the presumption that the northern kingdom that was captured by Assyria somehow went into captivity and somehow wandered off to Europe, populated the main houses in Europe, and, and uh, including the, king, the, the, the throne of England and so forth. There's a whole concept called British Israelism, that uh, the, real, you know, the, the real Israel is, uh, is uh, in Europe and so forth. There's a whole bunch of variations of these themes. They're very colorful. You'll run into people with very convincing charts and diagrams and colorful things. The problem with the whole thing is it's brutally assaulted by the facts. That uh, just not biblical. Because you will find people that take these ideas very seriously and it leads into all kinds of devious doctrines. See, I, I do suspect that the houses of Europe do have some interesting genealogies. But the genealogies goes back, interestingly enough, to Titus Vespasian, who was the prince that, whose people destroyed the temple. And his ancestor was Antiochus Epiphanes, the one that did the original abomination of desolation. And I do believe it's possible to put it together a genealogy all the way from Antiochus Epiphanes through Titus Vespasian to the one who will become the coming world leader to do the abomination of desolation that will occur in the temple yet to be rebuilt. So I think these ideas may provide a, a basis or a pseudo basis for the coming world leader. So I wouldn't get too caught up in those doctrines other than uh, they will be used to justify some uh, Satan's own schemes. But let's just hit the biblical basis for these schemes, the ten lost tribes. It's a misconception of misreading passages. You see, before the Assyrian captivity, even before the Assyrians captured the northern kingdom, many of those tribes had migrated southward to show loyalty to the house of David. And you'll find that in 1 Kings 12 and uh, 2 Chronicles 11. You'll find discussions where these tribes go south. Uh, the rebellion of Jeroboam that created the northern kingdom uh, also caused many of the tribal people up there who were loyal to the south to move south. We won't go through this all in detail. We have a, a commentary on the book of Joshua which sets aside a whole discussion of this subject in great detail for those of you who want to pursue it further. But uh, I, I will take a little bit of a look at this just to nail it down for ourselves right now. I encourage you to turn with me uh, to Second Chronicles 11. Second Chronicles 11 occurs about the time of the Civil War, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and the uh, the, the civil war in the country. In verse 13 of chapter 11, starting there, all the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their borders. This is uh, to Rehoboam. That's the, the good guy, so to speak, the one in the south. Verse 14, for the Levites left their suburban lands and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office under the Lord. Get the picture. There's civil war. In the south, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is faithful to the temple worship. Jeroboam in the north has not only got a civil war, but he is clinging to, he's instituting idolatry, false worship. Now, if you were a Levite in one of the 48 Levitical cities, and if one of those cities were one in the north, you're suddenly very politically incorrect. Your life, your whole tradition is temple worship. That's no longer the thing there. What are you going to do? If you're faithful, you're going to pick up and go down south where you'll be welcome. Follow me? That's really what it says. And by the way, not just the Levites. It mentions the Levites in verse 14. Let's read on. See, the point is that as, as verse 14 closed, Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office. See, because they're instituting idolatry. Verse 15, and he, that's Jeroboam, appointed for himself priests of the high places and for the he-goats. That's a, the term there in the Hebrew is a term for demons. And for the calves which he had made. In other words, there's golden calves. There's all this stuff going on in the north. Verse 16, and after them, that is after the Levites, 
out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. And so they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. Three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So the first thing you need to recognize here is the tribes are commingling. The faithful in the north migrated to the south to join those of like heart for the Lord God of Israel. Now it doesn't say this, but I think it's reasonable for us to conjecture that if you were in the south and you weren't faithful to the God of Israel, and you liked to idol worship, where would you go? Up north. That's really what it's portraying. See, what most people don't understand, the terms for the tribes are used two ways. They're used of the genealogical descendants of those 12 sons of Jacob. But it's also used of the territories. We speak of the region of Ephraim, or the tribe of Dan is a term used for the region of Dan, etc. They're geographical terms. It's sort of like saying a California. It can mean the state of California. It can mean a person from, that lives there in California. The term is used both ways, and people misunderstand that. The point is, first of all, when the Syria captures the northern kingdom, they're probably, in the slaves they grab, there's some from all 12 tribes. You follow me? And there's also members of all 12 tribes down in the south that are in the house of Judah. Do you follow me? Now, that's where the misleading ideas start. And we could go through all that where Shalmaneser V besieged Samaria three years, and they finally, King Hosea of Israel, revolts against paying tribute. Anyway, to make a long story short, they, in 721, Saragon II seized the power, took the throne, and uh, pulled down the towers, took about 27,000 captive, and uh, looted it. And I won't go through all that here. But uh, Now, it's interesting... In 2 Kings 17, the tribe of Judah, that phrase is used idiomatically for the whole southern kingdom. It's not just the house of Judah. They'll sometimes call it the tribe of Judah, but it's referring in some context to the southern kingdom. Now, incidentally, the remnant that returns from Babylon after the captivity is called Israel as the nation here in in Malachi. That's what gives us the springboard to to hit this issue. Uh, The Lord himself in the New Testament offered himself to the nation, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, in Matthew chapter 10. Other tribes than Judah are mentioned in the New Testament. In Matthew 4, Luke 2, Acts 4, Philippians 3, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are in focus in Acts 26, verse 7, James chapter 1, verse where the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ writes his, his epistle to the 12 tribes of Israel. And we could go on and on. You'll discover there's dozens of references that's after these captivities in the Old Testament and the New that refer to all 12 tribes. So this whole idea that there are 10 tribes that somehow are lost is a myth. It's a myth in literature. It's colorful. Uh, Many people take it very seriously, but it leads to all kinds of heresies, not the least of which is denying Israel its proper place in God's plan. These are subtle uh, devices by Satan to develop anti-Semitism. And so you want to be sensitive to that. If there's any concern in your mind of this, I encourage you to study it carefully. We deal with it in many places, but I think we probably deal with it most comprehensively in our Joshua commentary. We have a a companion volume of the Joshua series called The Twelve Tribes of Israel, but one of those tapes deals just with this issue uh, with uh, ample detail and notes and references you can check it into. Well, gee, we made it to verse 2. We're making great progress. God says something here. What a, in, in, what a way to begin an epistle. We have the introduction, verse 1. But then he says, God says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein have you thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And in verse 3, he's going to say, but I hated Esau. Big controversy about this verse. Let's take verse 2 first. I have loved you. That's probably the key statement in this book. The book of Malachi is going to really echo aspects of that whole issue. I'd like to pause here to talk a little bit about the Hebrew. They've discovered something. The Hebrew that you see, the funny little square-looking letters that you see Hebrew, that's the way Hebrew was written after the Babylonian captivity. Prior to their captivity in Babylon, the Hebrew alphabet was written with what they call pictographs. It was written differently. It was in Babylon that they developed this stylized form of what we recognize as Hebrew today. It turns out that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each letter was intended to be a picture of something. 
Now, there are such things in other languages where they represent pictures that are, in a sense, more abstract. But in the Hebrew, the alphabet is very unique because each picture represents not only a letter, it represents a concept. And if you know the 22 pictures, uh, they've discovered that if you teach kids those 22 ancient Hebrew pictures, they can read Hebrew with about 80% accuracy. The problem is they don't write it that way today, so you've got to learn the ancient pictographs. And let me give you an example of what I mean. The first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is an aleph. And if you look at Hebrew today, it's sort of a, almost an X-looking kind of thing. The original aleph was a little line with a loop. It was like a head of an ox. It's like an A upside down on its angle. In fact, that's where the A came from. It was turned, up, you know, turned around, but it represented the head of an ox like a little head with two horns out of it. And that was the aleph. It represented the ox, which was the symbol of strength. Or, since it's the first letter of the alphabet, it represented the leader, or first, or strength. That's what the term the aleph represented. The second letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the bet, or beth. In the original, it was a horizontal line with a little teepee on it. It represented a house. That later gets turned on its side through the Phoenicians and what have you, it becomes our B. But in the Hebrew, bet is stylized quite differently. But the ancient Hebrew bet was like a little line with a teepee. Well, if you take the aleph and the bet, you put them together, you've got the leader of the house. It's the word for father, ab or abba. You see how it starts to fit together? You see, the letters are not only the sound, they are the concept. That's what makes this unique. Another of the Hebrew letters is a he. It's a breath. When God changes Abraham's name to Abraham, he puts a heh in the middle of it, the Spirit of God. Or Sarai becomes Sarah. They get the Spirit of God. It's simply a breath. If you take the heh and put it in the middle of the word, then the word represents the essence of whatever else it meant. So if you take ab, an aleph, and a bet, which is father, and put a he in the middle of it, you get the essence of the Father. The word is ahab, love. See, the essence of the Father is love, even in the structure of the letters. I mean, I do get goosebumps about that because they're all together. And if you can develop this, you can find the cross, the crucifixion in the Torah, and it goes on and on and on. But if you understand the 22 letters, the pictographs, it'll startle you to discover the spiritual implications of the basic uh, structure of the language. So God says, he uses that term ahab here. It's an aleph with a hech and a beth. It's used 32 times in the Old Testament uh, for God's love. And that leads to some issues about God's love that we want to explore. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Hold your place here. We will return. (laughs) Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I want to call your attention to verses 7 and 8. These are important verses. You might even want to mark them. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not set his love upon you. Speaking to Israel, of course. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your, unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And goes on. This is an allusion, if you will, to God's sovereign love, his election love. He didn't choose them because they were worthy. Their worth he derives from the fact that he chose them. And God's love is, and I'll put in parentheses my own interpretation, always undeserved. God's love for you is something that he loves you because he chose to. Love is a commitment, not an emotion. And God is unconditionally committed to you. And it's by undeserved love. You'll find this here in Deuteronomy 7. You'll find it in Deuteronomy 10, 18, Hosea chapter 11, 1, and Romans 9, 13. So God's love is, first of all, unconditional. And boy, that's a hard concept for us to get used to. Because we use the word love in a totally different context. And I won't go through the classic four loves. You've all heard that. But I just want to focus on that, which I think we know, but we should just 
get in our minds is that when we think of love, we think of something that's a response. We think of it as an emotion. We think of it as the arrow. So we think of it as a, I love you because, fill in the blank. Whenever that changes, then I don't love you. No, God's love is unconditional. It's hard for us to grasp that. It's hard for us to appreciate what that means. But it's essential that we do. It's essential that we understand that. Now, something else about God's love that's is surprising, the fact that it's unconditional is exciting. God loves you and God never changes. You see why his unchangeableness, his immutability is so important? Because if he loves you, it's nothing that's going to change that. And we remember from our study in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, when did he choose you? Long before you were born, before the foundation of the world. Where he's going to make the point shortly here that he chose Jacob before, over Esau before they were born. How can he do that? Because he knows the end from the beginning. But um, that's not why he chose us. I think Wilbur Smith said, if, if, uh, if he chose me now, he, you know, he might change his mind. You know. But Moses finds something very surprising in God's love. Well, in fact, we should probably... Like, we're in Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy 10. And um, pick it up about verse oh, 14. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. Only the Lord had to delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. In Moses' tone here, you can what the idea is getting across is, here's the God of the universe who owns the heaven of heavens. And yet he... Loved your fathers, and thus you. He's amazed that God would bother, that his love is personal. In Hosea chapter 11, Hosea is amazed. He talks about the love as as a father taking his son by his arms to teach him to walk. You see, it's a very personal thing. And Hosea also points out, he draws his people with cords, but not ordinary cords, they're cords of love. And then, of course, he also speaks both in the Old and the New Testament. The, the highest form, at least the highest analogy, is the husband and wife. We talked about that when we studied Ephesians chapter 5. And it's that love that we need to try to understand. It's a love that's willing to forgive the most. That is, it's willing to look beyond and, and pay the price for the worst of faults. And yet is a love that condones the least. Because that love is, uh, while continuing to forgive, never ceases coaxing, urging, wishing, and hoping for the best in the other partner. So it's a love that um, is willing to look beyond the worst of faults and yet condone the least. And it's that tension, if you will, of the forgiving the most and condoning the least that helps us understand the uniqueness of God's love. He's got his most generous in offering a pardon and acceptance, while at the same time still maintaining uh, the high and holy standard of his righteousness to which he calls us. You see, he'll forgive the worst and yet uh, condones the least. He won't lower his standards to bring us in. So rather than giving up uh, and tending to condone our sins or failures to meet his high standards, he faithfully continues to love us without making excuses for our failures or lowering the standard to meet us where we are. Rather, he's given his own merit and righteousness on our behalf to make us eligible for that fellowship. So this is where God starts, that uh, he says, I have loved you. And then uh, in verse 2 he says, And yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and hated Esau. We'll come to that here in a minute. See, so Israel was called to reciprocate that love, in kind at least, and uh, yet they have scoffing skepticism. Their hard times cause them to veer towards a very pragmatic atheism. See, when times are hard, it's hard to believe that God loves us. And uh, that's really what the book of Malachi is all about. It was necessary to raise their sights from their myopic skepticism. Some of us in this room might feel that same way. We're going through tough times or have some affliction. The realities of our life may make us feel that, gee, God doesn't love us. And that's Satan's lie. And um, that's what Malachi is going to try to deal with. Now, in Israel's case... um, Their realities of life were quite different uh, than what they had expected because they looked at all the Messianic prophecies, miraculous fruitfulness of Ezekiel 34, the swelling population Isaiah talks about in 
Isaiah 54, the, the glorious reign of the Davidic reign that was coming in Jeremiah 23, and nations serving them, and Isaiah 49, they looked around and saw none of this. It was quite the opposite. The land was in, in bad shape, and uh, dwindling population, the rest. So now Malachi is going to hit this hard. The present hardships were brought on by a frigid formalism and disloyalty to their Lord. And their reluctant uh, uh, resultant sins and um, deeper sickness in their hearts and uh, external evidences uh, were all a lack of inward reality and, and fear of God. Lack of inward reality. And that's our danger too. Now what Malachi is going to do is urge them to get out of their self-pity long enough to observe their blood brothers, the Edomites. And we'll come to that here in a minute. Because there is a law of righteousness and morality that operated, always operates in history. And uh, uh, on more than one occasion, Edom, or Esau, Jacob's brother, refused to help or even worse, urged on an enemy and helped looting Israel when she's under attack. We find this discussed in Psalm 137. The book of Obadiah deals with this. Amos chapter 1 and Jeremiah 49 all have passages dealing with that. Now, Israel would also have been subject to God's removal. But God, his unmerited election love for her. And that's what Malachi is going to deal with here as we get further in the book. And then, of course, he also talks about the day of the Lord coming. So Malachi is going to reveal God in at least three relationships. Father, Lord, God, and Judge. And, of course, Israel's response here is sarcastic, oblivious, and supercilious. So the root of all of Israel's sins, by the way, were her unawareness of God's love. The unawareness of God's love. And also the unawareness, thus, of their own sin. Now we get to verse 3. And I hated Esau... And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now this is the verse that gives everybody a lot of problems. Because he loves Jacob and and hated Esau. And I love Griffith Thomas's reaction to this verse. His reaction is, uh, the mystery isn't why God hated Esau. The mystery is why he loved Jacob. (laughs) Many of the commentators see this love and hate thing in a comparative sense are an atonymic pair, like they're atonyms. We could go into Genesis 29, a lot of other examples of this, where that is used, that the words are used comparatively. Leah and Rachel, how one is loved more than the other. You can argue from the language, from Genesis, that this term simply means that he loved Jacob and he loved Esau less. And you can make that argument, many people do. The apostle Paul quotes this, in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, and he's quoting it not from Genesis, but from Malachi. And so we get the Holy Spirit illuminates this. You might want to just turn to that to see it for yourself. Turn to Romans chapter 9, in verse 13. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, verse 12, and as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And he goes on to make his point. He's drawing this distinction from Rebekah, etc., when the two twins, Jacob and Esau, are born. But he's quoting this directly from uh, the book of Malachi. And so the, the elder shall serve the younger is illustrating a doctrine of God in his sovereignty in dispensing favors. Jacob was chosen before he was born. And that's when you compare Genesis 25 through 2 with Romans 9:11 in here. In, in Romans, if you look back at verse 11, for the children being not yet born, having, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. You see the emphasis there. And so the statement in, in Romans 9.13 is quoted from this prophecy, not from Genesis. And although they're born as twins, uh, the hatred of Esau had been well deserved after he continued opposition to God through the centuries. See, when you study the history of Edom, you discover there's good reason for God to hate Esau. Now, all these theological problems evaporate if you recognize that time is a physical dimension. God's outside that. He can see the end from the beginning. So it's perfectly understandable for him to understand ahead of time what the guy was going to do. So this is, in effect, pointing to God's election love. But there's also God's justice love. And it turns out that uh, when that part of the world uh, was ravaged by the Chaldean army, the country of Edom was among the rest laid to ruins. And it was made literally for a habitation for dragons of the wilderness, as was foretold in Isaiah 34, verses 6 and 11. And uh, when Jerusalem was overthrown, the Edomites rejoiced at that. And that's in Psalm 137, 7. And therefore it was, it was uh, just with God to put the same cup of trembling in their hands. And though Edom's ruins were the last, they were permanent. 
They were lasting. And there's a difference between Jacob and Esau in that Jacob was, yes, he had ruin, but he was rebuilt. Edom was not. And uh, it says in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 15, against Israel, God was a little displeased, but against Edom, he had his indignation. And will have forever, for they are the people of his curse, Isaiah says in chapter 34, verse 5. So let's talk a little bit more about Edom. We get down to verse 4 here. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. See, this business of you saying, well, we're impoverished, but we're going to rebuild, that's their boast, their brag, their hope. But God says, no way. Their ruin, their desolation is permanent. This wasting of his heritage is uh, made it a, literally a place for jackals in the wilderness. And uh, every attempt to rebuild will be met with defeat. Jacob's cities were also laid waste, but they were rebuilt. Edom's are laid waste, but were never rebuilt. See, the sufferings of the righteous will have an end, and will end well. But, and all their grievances will be redressed, their sorrow will be turned to joy. But the sufferings of the wicked will be endless and remediless as Edom's desolation. That's something you and I have no capacity to understand, to be without hope. See, no matter how bad it gets, you can always hope that it's going to get better. See, from Jake's point, they've got the troubles, but they know they've got promises, and they know God will keep those promises. But the Edomites know. And God is saying, you may try to build, but no way, I'll throw you down. Forever. And um, that's probably the best description of hell in the scripture is all these idioms of fire and so forth are probably idioms of trying to describe something we have no capacity to understand. But the one thing that does describe it perhaps more eloquently than anything else is a place that is eternally without hope. You and I have no capacity to imagine being without hope. Now, we have here, of course, the fact that the hopes of the Edomites are vain and uh, the disappointment of them. We will build, they say, but of course God won't. Their attempts will be uh, baffled or thrown down. Now, that's exactly, incidentally, the Edomites were then wiped out by the Nabataean Arabs in the 5th century B.C., ransacked Edom and, and leaving only pockets of refugees in the Negev Desert, according to 1st Maccabees. And it was these same Nabataeans that set up a nation called Idumea with its capital in Hebron, and one of its great cities built in the cliffs was called Petra. But their destruction of Edom was permanent, you know, Edom in the sense of really being true Edomites. And um, when is the last time you ever saw an Edomite? Anyone? Going. So this judgment of God against Edom should also warn not only a skeptical Jacob, here's Jacob or Israel, uh, skeptical, it was in a sense Malachi's way of warning them by looking at their destiny to realize where they really are, how much better off they are, because they have in fact a covenant commitment with the God of the universe. But um, the judgment of God against Edom should be a warning against Jacob, it also should be a warning to America. One of the questions you and I do not know the answer to, are we Israel? by analogy, or are we Edom? Interesting question right now. Edom was known in Malachi uh, verse 4 as the wicked country. What's America known as? The great Satan. Now that's that's an appellation by our enemies, and yet it's not without merit. But getting back to Petra, I I can't touch on this issue. We'll go forward in Malachi. But uh, the other issue to think about Uh, There's a very, very peculiar prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. And we'll just touch upon it quickly, but it's something to be aware of for lots of reasons. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, Daniel 11, the last half of Daniel 11, deals with the uh, career and and issues of the, uh, the Antichrist. In verse 41 of Daniel 11, Speaking of this coming world leader, the Antichrist, as he's popularly called, it says, He shall enter also into the glorious land, that's a term for Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. This is a very strange verse, because most of the verses in the book of Daniel, book of Revelation, elsewhere, emphasize that he will rule, if not literally all, virtually most of the world. He's going to be a world leader. That's why I prefer the term, the coming world leader. He has 33 different titles in the Old Testament. The Word of God highlights a region that, for some reason, escapes his thumb. And that's Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Adam. Now, those 
areas, if you look at a biblical map in the back of your Bible, you'll discover that area is known today as Jordan. It was a creation of Winston Churchill during the Second World War called Transjordan and, and thus uh, laid the groundwork for this, the country that today is known as Jordan. Very unusual history. Why would the Holy Spirit have that region escape the hand of the Antichrist? It's a speculation, but most scholars recognize all kinds of prophecies which indicate that the remnant of Israel, when they flee the uh, attack on Jerusalem at the very, very end, the Battle of Armageddon and all of that, they flee to Basra. Now, Basra, the term Basra means a sheepfold. And many scholars believe that refers, in effect, to Petra. There's also a city called Basra, but they believe it refers to Petra because it's a natural sheepfold. A very good hold over a million inhabitants, but you can only get in by a very, very narrow gorge. And uh, Petra is a very fascinating place to visit. And it looks like it is being sort of set apart in history to provide that opportunity for the remnant to flee there. And that's the place that Jesus comes and fights for them before going to the Mount of Olives when he does return. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this whole area, to we have a briefing called uh, the next Holocaust, the Refugee Needham. And you might want to look at that for a little more background. Well, we're down to verse 5. Making great progress tonight. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say... The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. What this is really saying is that God is going to be magnified beyond Israel alone. Psalm 35, verse 27, Psalm 40 uh, also touches on this, that God is going to be magnified in the world beyond Israel alone. So God's love, again, what Malachi is saying, God's love in its graciousness and in its judgments will exceed the traditional national, geographic, political, uh, or cultural boundaries. And Malachi is in effect saying it's going to go beyond them just as God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Remember in the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees uh, and uh, promises that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And uh, the word blessing there is used by Paul in Galatians 3.8 as referring to the gospel. The gospel. And, of course, all mankind has been offered salvation, in effect, through Jacob. We've got a lot more to do, of course, in Malachi, but so far the one caution that is flying at the masthead here with Malachi is that we should be careful not to doubt God's love just because we might be in some affliction that God has brought upon us to strengthen us, to grow us, or to prepare us to minister to some others with that affliction. If you're going through some unusual trouble, God has a hundred ways to ask you, do you trust me? And one of the reasons, not the only purpose of suffering, but one of the reasons is that he may be preparing you to minister to people that have that problem. Unless you've been there, you know. So um, we'll pick it up next time at verse 6 and uh, move a little bit faster, I think, as we go. We won't have all the background. But the people of God, apparently here, and we're going to see a little more of that as we go, were insensitive to God's blessings. God blessed them abundantly, and they were not sensitive to that. Are we? Are you and I sensitive? Do we realize how much God has blessed you? Have you ever tried in a quiet time, what was your prayer? Have you ever tried to list the way God has blessed you? You know, there isn't time. Somebody says, you know, I, I pray, but gee, I can't see how these people spend hours in prayer. First of all, it depends how, how intimate you are with them. But the second thing is, is just try being exhaustive. And you can't be. It's, it blows you away. But the other thing that the, the Malachi's readers or listeners were obtuse to was their own departure from what he wanted them to be, their departure from him. Now, it's interesting when you get to the book of Revelation, you get to the New Testament, we have, of course, uh, 21 epistles in the New Testament, but there's seven everybody always overlooks. There's actually 28 epistles. The seven that you overlook are by Jesus Christ himself. The seven letters to seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. What's interesting about those seven letters is they are basically report cards. And what's amazing, there are many things about the seven letters. That's a, it, it's entitled to a very specialized study in its own right. And I encourage you to do that if you haven't. If all, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that has a promise of blessing to the reader. No other book of the Bible has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. Revelation does. But as you study the book of Revelation, and I've made it a hobby for more than 40 years, you'll discover very quickly the most relevant, most mystical, but the most useful, practical, relevant part of the entire book 
and the only part of the book that applies to you and I, to you and me, I'm sorry, someday I'll learn that, right, is chapter 2 and 3. From chapter 4 on, it's uh, post-rapture. 6 through 19 is an expansion of the 70th week of Daniel. We're going to watch it from the mezzanine. Now, of those seven letters to seven churches, the surprising thing is that every church was surprised. When you read those letters, you discover... Now, we're not talking now early church, first several centuries. We're talking within 60 years of, of, or so of the crucifixion. And already by then, the church is in trouble. The church didn't get in trouble in the first, second, third century. Yeah, it was in trouble already. Jesus writes the report card. But what's interesting, even the churches that were doing well are surprised. They didn't know how well they're doing. The churches that are not doing well are also surprised. There's two churches there that uh, nothing bad was said of. There's two churches there that nothing good was said of. But the interesting thing is in all seven churches, you, if you read the letter and understand the letter, you discover this is news for the church. The church is surprised. They didn't realize where they were. I wonder if we know where we are. Some things we probably feel pretty good about. Well, we might re-examine that and, and really understand where we are. And, of course, uh, in, in Malachi, all of them had a lack of uh, reverence for God. Just returned from a conference where Alan Keyes, one of the ones that made a run for a uh, nomination of president, gave an articulate presentation of our heritage, the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, where all men are created equal. When he got the word created, he paused. Uh, he says, I love to pause after that word. All men were created Yes, equal, but first point, it's created. Think about it. Do we deny that today in this country? And uh, where the creator uh, is the source of our inalienable rights, not man. See, one thing you need to realize, the globalists that would enslave you that are pushing for a global government, the first thing they have to do is deny God to get there. Because our heritage says that our rights are given to us not by man but by God. Therefore, they're not negotiable. And so the first thing you have to do is to get God out of the equation if you're going to enslave those people. Kind of interesting. So Malachi is all about the love of God. And this precedes all other issues. You can't love God. You can't respond to God. You can't do anything until you discover that God really loves you. And my wife has done a, a beautiful job of this with her world-famous series over the last 20 years called The Way of Agape. And the first step she's discovered, both from the Scripture and also from her experience with counseling people and rest, is that until you discover God loves you, you're, you're dead in the water. You need to discover the, the breathtaking discovery that God really loves you. And the way of agape is a prelude to its sequel, Be Ye Transformed. The Be Ye Transformed book is incredibly popular, getting grave notices, changing lives. It's wonderful. But partly, I believe, it's because of the prelude. You really need to understand God loves you first. And the other thing that Malachi, in effect, is going to deal with as we go is that God is a person, not some kind of force or the pantheism of the New Agers. And one of the questions we want to be asking ourselves as we get deeper into Malachi, as we understand the predicament he's dealing with there, is are we Israel, allegorically, or are we Edom? Makes a big difference. Makes a big difference. Us individually, God loves us. But what's our response to Him? Let's bow our hearts. We sure praise You, Father. And we thank You for bringing us here together right now. We thank You, Father, for loving us so much that You have revealed Yourself to us in Your Word, that You have brought us together to this point in time, and above all, Father, that You've revealed Yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. And Father, we would pray that through the ministry of your Holy Spirit that you would lift off the scales of our eyes that we might really behold just who you are. That we might really behold the extremes that you have gone to to manifest your love toward us. We thank you, Father, for loving us so much. So, Father, we would ask, too, that as we apprehend that love, as we begin to understand it, that you would, through your ministry of your Holy Spirit, 
Invoke that response that you would have from us, Father. Not by power nor by might, but by your Spirit, Father. Help us each to be more responsive to your will in our lives. Help us, Father, to shed empty formalism in all its shapes and sizes and enter into that relationship with the one that loved us so much as to go to that cross in Judea 2,000 years ago. We thank you, Father, too, that you've called us out of the mire that we were in into the fellowship that we have with you. We pray, Father, that you would help us to more fully take advantage of the, the relationship that's there, of the fellowship that's there, of the intimacy that's there. For we commit ourselves before you, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.